We already have a dozen or so content pieces showing that delitting can improve thermal performance of Intel CPUs significantly, but we've always put the stock Intel heat spreader back in place. Today we're trying a $20 accessory. It's a CNC machined copper IHS that we bought from Rocket Cool, which purportedly increases service area by a claimed 15% and smooths out the points of contact. Intel's stock IHS is a nickel plated copper block, but is smaller in exposed surface area than the Rocket Cool alternative. At $14 to $20, it seemed worth trying out. Today we're looking to see if there's any meaningful difference in thermal performance for the Intel i7-8700K when using the stock versus the aftermarket copper IHS. Before getting to that, this video is sponsored by Dollar Shave Club, makers of the new $5 sh shower shave starter set. The kit includes the Dollar Shave Club executive razor bearing the heft of any high quality tool and also includes reloadable cartridges. The $5 kit includes everything you see on the screen now, like the body wash and shave butter, and can be refilled for a few dollars a month. This deal is available for $5 exclusively using our link below or dollarshaveclub.com slash gamersnexus. This is pretty simple on the surface of it. To get everyone up to speed, an integrated heat spreader by Intel, the sort of silver looking one, is actually copper. It's just nickel plated and it's not the shiny kind either. So it is a copper IHS or integrated heat spreader. This is a copper IHS. It's not nickel plated, doesn't really matter a lot. What matters more here is that this has a slightly larger surface area, which is done just by kind of, the Intel IHS has some more lower down dead zones around the outer edges of it. It's made to fit basically all the Intel CPUs of the same socket type. So it's not like they custom tune it. This is custom tuned for LGA 11.5X and uh, is a bit larger in surface area. So it's ultimately surface area that matters because that's, increasing the amount of contact area between the IHS and the cooling element on top of it, or the heat sink, I should say, the cold plate. So that's what we care about. Replacing it's pretty easy. It's, you can watch any of our delitting videos. It's the same process. You pop the CPU into a delitter, you delit it, and then you pull the IHS off and start to replace it with this one. In the process of doing so, there are a couple things to watch out for, like the alignment of these ridges on the outer edges. Uh, there is a guide that's pretty good. You need to basically make sure that the arrow is aligned with the arrow and the delitter, and then you just mount this onto it. Uh, the only downside, so there's a couple things to watch out for here, relitting or resealing a component. Whenever you reseal an Intel CPU, there's a really good chance that you just killed all of your delitting performance improvement. Because from doing this several times now, for multiple YouTubers as well, I can tell you, ideally you do not reseal it with silicone adhesive. You leave the thing delitted. Yes, you put the IHS back on. However, uh, when you put it back on, we recommend that you just sort of, you drop the CPU uh, into the socket without ever moving it any other way. You hold the CPU and the IHS like this in transit and don't let it slide around, but also don't reseal it. So the downside to that is you can't really move the CPU in any kind of normal way. You have to be really careful about it so that there's no sliding, you don't have the liquid metal run over onto components, onto SMDs, or you don't have the liquid metal just lose contact in general. However, the upside is that you don't have a sealant around the edges that will increase the uh, sort of Z height between, or the gap between the IHS and the die. That's what kills performance. And that's actually on Intel CPU, more of what kills performance in some cases than the thermal paste alone. So it's the, you want to avoid silicone adhesive resealing. So for our testing, we tested without resealing the CPU. I dropped it into the socket with the liquid metal applied how I wanted it. And that was just the bare substrate with the die. And then I put the liquid metal on this side. It's kind of, I mean, it's, it's basically stained now. That's not actually liquid anymore. But I put the liquid metal on this side and then dropped that on top of the CPU right where I wanted it, as the instructions recommended, latched it down and then put the cooler on. That's what I would recommend because when I did try resealing this, because it is easier to transport it, but it just, it kills the thermals and you introduce a lot of variants, it's not worth it. Just, just do it without the sealant. So let's get into some of the data here. Test methods, we used liquid metal conductonaut. So this is a thermal grizzly conductonaut that we used between the die and the heat spreader on both the Intel and the aftermarket solution. We ran three tests. 
And for each of those three tests, uh, three tests per IHS, so six total, uh, times an additional three tests, uh, so like 18. And so we had basically three sets of frequencies and voltages tested three times each, so three iterations. And then uh, in between each of those, we reapplied the liquid metal and the thermal paste and then average all the data, throw out anything that looks bad because there's a lot of human element involved here where application of thermal paste on top of the IHS can vary and application of liquid metal under the IHS can vary. So hence uh, running three different iterations of them or test passes and averaging. And it looked pretty good after all of that. So fairly consistent overall, we established a plus or minus about 0.7 degrees run to run variance with those reapplications. And additional information on testing will be in the article linked in the description below as always, but we can get into the charts now. So this chart is really what we ultimately ended up with. At five gigahertz and 1.42 volts, we end up generating between 200 watts and 220 watts at the EPS 12 volt cables. That configuration isn't on here, it's just in between the other two. So depending on the test, that's where you're at for wattage, 200 to 220 watts. And give or take a couple watts, of course, for the two tested voltages here, stock temperature monitoring showed 49.5 degrees Celsius over ambient for baseline average of all core temperatures. And that's also averaged after a 30 minute burn in mark on our X62 with max fan speeds, which allows the radiator to soak and hit equilibrium. The peak 10 second high was 51.6 degrees Celsius with a liquid temperature at 13.8 degrees Celsius. For the rocket cool IHS, we measured 44.5 degrees for the same test or 48.2 across the peak high and liquid was roughly equivalent within margin of error. These differences between the temperatures are just outside of error margins and we can only confidently say that they are outside of the margins of error because we ran the test enough times to establish what kind of variance we had, which was not a whole lot. So with each one of these using a new liquid metal and paste application, we end up looking pretty even across the board, scoring about the same from run to run. This helps ensure that we're using the same application technique each time. We're also using a graduated syringe for the thermal paste to make sure that it's an even amount each time. The result is a slight temperature improvement with the rocket cool solution, roughly in the range of three to five degrees Celsius. So not at all bad for a copper brick that you replace the Intel one with. And at 1.44 volts and 5.1 gigahertz, we saw nearly identical deltas to the previous. The stock IHS reported 56.8 degrees or 60 degrees peak high temperature, and the rocket cool IHS resulted in a 51.8 degree average or 56.5 degrees for the 10 second high. The improvement, again, is a range of about three to five degrees depending on how loose you are with your error margins and liquid temperatures are about the same. As for temperature over time, the IHS change doesn't meaningfully impact or elongate the heating period in our test setup. The rocket cool kit is routinely shown below the stock IHS by a few degrees, but there's no actual change to the ramp up or the ramp down time for temperature, at least not one that exits error margins. One more reason that the custom copper IHS helps here is less about the extra surface area, and there is more because if you look at the Intel one, it's got that lowered surface around the edges and the custom one takes the whole surface area, but it's less about that and also about the flatness of the surface. The Intel heat spreader stock is actually very slightly convex and the Asatec cold plates, some of the other cold plates on the market are slightly concave. This is to somewhat account for the bend in the Intel IHS but not everyone does it and also you've got two modes of manufacturing tolerance to deal with there where now you're relying on both intel and the cold plate manufacturer to align perfectly with their concave and convex bends this ihs is flatter it removes that it's actually basically perfectly flat and ultimately when you mount it all down anyway most of the cold plates kind of become flat just from the mounting pressure to begin with so that's another big contributor aside from the extra service area as far as the copper versus the nickel plated copper, that probably has very little to do with anything here. It's all copper at the end of the day. So what we're really looking at is the other factors mentioned. Overall then it's pretty straightforward. We get a couple degree improvement and honestly, it's, it's more than I was expecting. For, it's $14 without the relid tool. If you already have the D-lid kit, it's a bit easier to get with. But at $20 for the complete kit, 
it's really not bad. I, I was pleasantly surprised with how well this worked. Now, when I say how well it worked, I mean relative to its price, relative to the effort involved, and relative to, to what it is. It's a piece of copper. Now, it's a nicely machined piece of copper, and Rocket Cool did a great job of it. Uh, this isn't something that's going to change a lot for you in terms of your overclocking headroom. It's probably not going to change a lot you, for you in terms of voltages. It's all going to be about the same as where it was before. You might be able to very marginally reduce your fan speeds. You might be able to very marginally reduce your cooler size. But this is, it's, it's one of those enthusiast items that uh, if you asked me, is it worth buying straight out? No, uh, no extras tagged onto that at all. Not, is it worth buying as an enthusiast? Is it worth buying for a budget user? If you just straight ask me, is it worth $20? I'd probably say no in terms of just, I, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't do a ton for you. However, from an enthusiast perspective, in terms of you're already delitting the CPU, you're already putting liquid metal on it, I'm actually pretty happy with it. So I would buy one, but I would also buy one not expecting a lot out of it. You get a couple degrees. What does that really do for you? If you already know, if you have a target in mind, I need an extra couple degrees to get to this threshold that will numerically satisfy my OCD or something like that. If, if you already have an objective, then yes, it's worth picking up. Um, I wouldn't buy it expecting a lot in terms of overclocking, but it's never bad to run at a lower temperature either. That's always pretty much a good thing in 99% of cases. So uh, yeah, it's I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, and I would recommend it if you're just kind of like, you want a Saturday project, you want to play around with computer parts for 20 bucks for an hour or so. It's a pretty good project for that. But outside of that, it is a bit of work. It's not hard, but I did have to reapply it a couple times when I first went through with it to make sure I'd aligned it correctly, make sure the liquid metal wasn't sliding around underneath, just like any D-lid process. I mean, yeah, don't expect great things, but you can expect decent things out of it. And I think other than that, uh, do keep in mind that if you try to validate your own thermals run to run, like before and after, it is pretty hard to actually run thermal tests properly you'll want to use uh, probably something like hardware info to log and do it over time. Don't just spot check it and then run averages. And you'll also probably uh, want like a current clamp on the EPS 12 volt cables so you can make sure the software is pushing the same amount of current into the CPU each time because running Blender or Prime or whatever, pass A to pass B, there can certainly be variants of sometimes 20 watts and that's enough to eliminate some of the, the advantages you might see, or even you can make one look worse than the other if the power input is different. So if you're trying to validate your own numbers, make sure you control as much as possible and get something on there to read the power. And then you should be good. Uh, Hardware Info does a pretty good job at reading the wattage from most CPUs. You can use that for pretty much everything in lieu of a current clamp. So yeah, uh, overall, very quick recap here is for $20, uh, I do really like the idea of just a fun Saturday enthusiast project because it's so cheap that it's basically something you do because you haven't messed around with your computer in a while and you feel like that'd be fun. Uh, there is not much more reason than that that I would buy it. Uh, you know, you, you might as well just buy a better cooler if you're really digging for temperature uh, improvements and the D-Lid should do a lot for you anyway. But um, it's still admirable for, you know, a small thing like that, get a couple degrees out of it. So uh, that's it for this one. Pretty fun. If you have suggestions for similar stuff like this, like small computer component accessories, enthusiast type products that you don't see a lot of tests for, uh, we like working with these. It's fun to do. It's not a big expense to buy it. So let me know in the comments below what kinds of things you've seen that you'd like us to try out. And subscribe for more. As always, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly and go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or one of our other products. I'll see you all next time.